Okay, well, I'm still expecting a few more people, but I think we're safe to get started. So welcome everyone to today's session brought to you by Invest Ottawa as part of the Digital Main Street Future Proofing Program. Digital Main Street is cost-free and made possible by the generous support of the Government of Canada and FedDev Ontario through the Regional Relief and Recovery Fund. My name is Kyle and I am the DMS Program Coordinator with Invest Ottawa. In today's session, we will learn about the future of retail in Canada, hosted by Craig Patterson, who is here on the screen with me. Uh, he is a founder and editor-in-chief of Canada's most read online retail industry news publication, Retail Insider. He is also the direct, a director at the University of Alberta School of Retailing, as well as a research consultant at the Retail Council of Canada. If you have any questions throughout the session, please use the Q&A function and we'll answer them throughout the session and feel free to engage with us in the chat, as I mentioned earlier. And we will also send a follow-up email with information on how to get involved in our free DMS programming, such as Shop Here, where you can get an e-commerce store built for you, uh, or Future Proofing, where you can get access to a digital transformation squad that can help you with your, uh, your business's digital marketing needs. So that's enough about me. Um, so thank you for joining us today. And here is our guest speaker, Craig Patterson. Thank Hello, you. everyone. <laughs> Thanks for uh, signing in here today for this. Uh, I'm going to do a bit of an overview of uh, the Canadian retail industry, including uh, uh, what was happening before COVID-19, uh, including some ancient history, uh, going into uh, what happened during COVID and what's happening now. So uh, we'll get into that. And I've got a series of slides, which I'm going to be sharing here. So uh, give me one moment and let's uh, put the, actually, I'm just going to give me, a, I'm going to go back to the first slide and then I'm going <laughs> to share them. Whoops. There we go. Okay. Oh. Are you having some technical difficulties? Oh, there we go. I, I got the share screen. Yeah, it just took a moment. The little screen got minimized. Okay, here we go. There we go. We got the website and email here. So that's, that's what I look like when I'm cleaned up a bit. Uh, <laughs> so we'll uh, get into here a little bit. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about retail history. One of the reasons I wanted to do this is because uh, this does tell us uh, kind of what happened and, and it builds a timeline which allows us to understand where we're going. Uh, this isn't something I realized until I, until I started studying some of the history of retail in Canada as well as elsewhere. And I thought, well, there's a clear pattern that we're seeing. It's something that I, I didn't uh, identify beforehand. Uh, a lot of people, including a lot of analysts haven't, but um, here we go. Let's, let's dive into this here. And, and by the way, if you have questions, uh, feel free to put them into the chat and uh, we can try to answer them here as well. So um, what we're gonna talk about here a little bit is uh, the early 1900s. Um, so retail really started off as being quite utilitarian. Uh, Canada, you know, is a fairly new country overall. We were founded in 1867. Uh, typically had, you know, we started off with the trading posts. It started into small general retailers. Uh, that actually changed. There were some innovators out there uh, who formed uh, large format retailers we now know as department stores. Uh, I, I think department stores are quite interesting because in many respects, they were even our first shopping centers to a degree. Uh, they were retail nodes that a lot of people were going to. Uh, this slide is a photo or a rendering, it's not an actual photo of the Freeman's store on Rideau Street in Ottawa, which is now the Hudson Bay Company and there's a Saks Off Fifth uh, store in the basement. So um, department stores were critical to uh, downtown cores in the early 1900s until at least the 1950s. Uh, and, and beyond, Ottawa is lucky to still have uh, several uh, department store size stores in the downtown core. Uh, obviously, the Hudson Bay Company is still there. Uh, La Maison Simons at the CF Rideau Centre, as well as Nordstrom are also there. Uh, in years past, Holt Renfrew, uh, the upscale uh, junior department store, had a location in Ottawa, but it uh, closed down for various reasons. So uh, retail, uh, af after department stores came into play, we started to see shopping centers. Uh, in some cases, the department stores themselves actually developed these shopping centers, which uh, I think is really quite interesting because in some respects, the department store helped uh, create its own irrelevancy. <laughs> so uh, department stores had you know, developed these shopping centers. They gave brands a place to uh, showcase their wares, uh, which actually ended up making the department store a little bit less relevant in terms of being a place to explore for brands. 
Uh, department stores also started uh, discounting. Uh, like I mentioned, the Saks off Fifth being in the basement of uh, the Hudson Bay building. Uh, that was a spinoff of uh, Saks Fifth Avenue, the American department store. Uh, Nordstrom Rack is at Ottawa Train Yards. Uh, there's all kinds of uh, you know, winners and marshals uh, in, in the Ottawa area. But um, these, uh, these discounters, I think, really did hit department stores quite hard. People became sensitive to price. Then we saw uh, category killers come in, uh, which would be the likes of a Walmart and uh, Costco. Uh, again, offering consumers value, uh, making it challenging for the department store, and in, in some cases, even the shopping center. Again, like I said, there's a progression in terms of retail, uh, what we've seen over the years in terms of uh, um, consumer shopping a little bit differently. Uh, one of the biggest trends we're seeing now is uh, direct to consumer uh, brands where brands are opening their own stores. Uh, Canada Goose uh, very recently opened a store, I think it was last week at CF Rideau Center. Uh, this is an example of a brand which you would have only found in a multi-brand retailer like a Nordstrom or a Harry Rosen before, but now you can actually shop in that store. So uh, that again has uh, been a trend. It's also led to challenges for department stores because uh, they are no longer, again, the place to get these brands. So uh, it's been a really interesting progression. And then, of course, uh, one of the biggest disruptors in retail, uh, which has been uh, primarily in the last 20 years and is growing very quickly over the last few years and very recently as well, is online shopping. So uh, the world is uh, blurring the lines of physical retail and uh, online shopping. Uh, you throw social media in there as well, which uh, we're able to shop on and we'll be able to more so in the future. And uh, the world of retail as well as the world generally is changing. And uh, one thing, of course, I'll point out is that being a consumer society, I think uh, retail is uh, very much a part of our lives. Uh, it's uh, the largest employer, private sector employer in the country. Uh, and is an economic generator. Uh, millions of jobs are either directly in the retail industry in Canada or support the retail industry from brokers to construction, cleaning companies, whatever you can think of that would be uh, uh, serving retailers. We'll go into uh, a bit more recent history, 2008 and 2009. Uh, we had a recession uh, which hit a lot of people, but uh, subsequently, we ended up in a really interesting boom period, which is not something that uh, many people had expected. Uh, with downturns, uh, some analysts think that things will go on for a long time or forever. Uh, it usually isn't the case. Hopefully, that's going to be the case again with COVID when we kind of get out of this, whatever that's going to be, however that's going to be. But uh, we did see a boom. So um, that boom resulted in uh, an unprecedented growth, certainly in our lifetimes of retail in Canada. So uh, we saw retailers like Nordstrom come into Canada. The first store was in Calgary. The second one was in Ottawa at the CF Rideau Center. Uh, we saw, again, the Hudson Bay Company bring Saks Fifth Avenue into Canada, as well as Saks Off Fifth, which uh, has a store in Ottawa. Uh, and then other brands have come in. We had over 200 international retailers uh, come into the Canadian markets between about 2013 and 2019, 2020 being the year that it is. Uh, we will still see some, we are seeing some, but we won't see nearly as many as we have in the past. In 2017, I tracked more than 50 international brands that had come into Canada by opening stores, which probably was the highest in the history of this country. So uh, it's interesting to see. Uh, it's creating a lot of retail competition. It's changing uh, where we go, uh, what we wear, and uh, how we eat, etc. So uh, very interesting. Um, so again, we ran it. We went into this boom period over a period of ten years in Canada. Uh, Target, interestingly enough, announced where its stores were going, which maybe wasn't the best idea for them because. Uh, all you know, the other retailers that were going to be competing with them uh, said, well, great, we're going to update our stores in these markets. And what we ended up having, or what, what, ended, up, what ended up happening is uh, we ended up with some of the best grocery and drug stores, I would say, in the world. Uh, they've really, really upped their game. They're continuing to innovate. Uh, we've got Shoppers Drug Mart here, which Loblaws actually ended up acquiring uh, in, uh, I think it was 2013 or 14. 
um, uh, again, Shoppers Drug Mart just bought, uh, spent $75 million to buy uh, shares in a telemedicine company that they'll be integrating into the retail operations. Uh, Loblaws has innovated with its food across all of its banners from Superstore to Loblaws to, uh, you know, some of the smaller names that the, uh, the retailer has as well. Uh, and, we, you know, Homegrown Farm Boy uh, was acquired by Empire. Uh, again, I, I would say a world-class retailer. Uh, absolutely excellent. Uh, I can't wait for the one to open near where I live. I'm in Toronto right now. So uh, definitely looking forward to Farm Boy. It's, it's one of the best retailers out there. So uh, we did end up with, uh, you know, great retail, uh, better retail environments. Uh, the experience was there and, and retailers continued to up their game in e-commerce as well. Uh, and again, these being larger retailers, the smaller retailers are going to have to follow suit. And uh, we can talk about Digital Main Street a bit after that as well, because that's uh, one of the mandates that we're seeing there. So uh, one thing that we noticed was that uh, the consumer started, I don't want to say getting tired of retail, but there was certainly a slowdown in certain sectors, especially in fashion. Uh, consumers were also spending uh, in other areas, they were they were going online more. So from 2018 to uh, early 2020, uh, we were seeing a slowdown, and this did cause uh, some problems for some retailers. And I should say again, feel free to jump in with any questions. Uh, can't quite see the uh, the question box here, but yeah, Kyle, if anything comes up, let me know. Sure. And again, we're just giving a bit of a background here. Whoops, I actually hit the wrong thing. Okay. So like I said, consumers started to get, and I don't want to say bored, but certainly distracted. Uh, things that were creating excitement uh, may have been around, uh, say, social media like Instagram or TikTok. Uh, people were going out to restaurants more. Uh, people were spending more on uh, other things, uh, including, say, technology. Uh, my iPhone cost way more money than it should have. Uh, also, the cost of living continued to go up. Our, our housing costs in different parts of the country are uh, extremely high, uh, which again takes away uh, dollars that consumers could be spending elsewhere. So uh, this has really hit retail. So uh, we started seeing store closures, which was uh, a little bit scary. And again, keeping in mind, this is actually before COVID-19. So things were already starting to get bad. We had retailers that were in challenged cash, position, cash positions. That's a tongue twister. Uh, also, uh, you know, many retailers had incurred debt because they were trying to uh, improve their operations or, or just continue to operate. But we're, uh, you know, in, in say March of 2020, retailers were just trying to get back on track after the uh, December holiday shopping season and then COVID hit. But um, in Q1 of 2020, uh, we tracked more than a thousand individual store locations that were set to permanently close in Canada. Uh, this became a bit of a scary situation not even close to what it is now, but uh, it was very, very concerning because again, we had nothing impacting this other than a change in the consumer, uh, which was financial as well as social. So uh, that, you know, I wrote an article on that. It got lots of readers, uh, but nothing close to what was going to hit next. So uh, COVID-19 hit us uh, not at a good time in the retail industry. Like I said, uh, we had store closures in uh, March. Uh, some were mandated by government, some were voluntary, some retailers such the, that were deemed to be, um, uh, you know, uh, essential or, uh, you know, grocery stores and drug stores and whatnot were able to stay open. But we saw a lot of other retailers closing, including food service, uh, like restaurants, which uh, has just really, really impacted that industry as well. Uh, so we saw a retail shutdown uh, over... Uh, it, it depending on parts of the country for over two months uh, here in Ontario, we had it more so than some parts of the country, especially the Maritimes and uh, British Columbia. Uh, that shutdown really, really hit retail in Canada. I'm just going to check my uh, next slide here because uh, consumers uh, are afraid to go out. Uh, this is still the case uh, for, for some, especially those who are immune compromised or a bit older. Uh, we've had restaurants that have uh, closed down as people are eating at home more. Uh, that was certainly uh, during the time that people were staying at home, uh, as well as now. Uh, some are forecasting that over 50% of our restaurants uh, in Canada will be closed by uh, before December of this year, unfortunately. And 
uh, that that you know is is not a good statistic. I think that some of our favorite places we may not be able to eat at anymore, and, and that's really too bad. Um, we saw job losses, which were catastrophic. Uh, millions of people were were laid off temporarily. Some won't have jobs to go back to. Uh, we saw stock market declines. The stock market is still going crazy today, uh, not in a good way. Uh, we saw oil prices uh, going down as well, which again affected the wealth of Canadians as well as the overall consumer uh, perception of what was happening and whether or not they should be spending. And again, a happy, comfortable consumer is going to spend more than a consumer that's worried, unless the worry is so great and they think they're going to die, they're going to splurge, but that's not where we're at, hopefully, at this time uh, in Canada. Um, some of the things that have certainly impacted retailers uh, have been uh, rents, uh, which can be astronomical in some retail spaces, depending where you are. Uh, it's a huge expense for retailers that have a physical location, which is one of the reasons why some have been looking to get online primarily, or certainly to uh, have a major online presence. Um, and unfortunately, it was a situation, I don't think that things were quite done the way that they should have been, but there was rent relief that was offered, but it was done through Canada Mortgage and Housing. What that ended up doing was uh, creating a situation where the landlords had to apply for the rent relief for the tenants. Uh, that didn't work so well. So only, you know, a minority of businesses that would have qualified for rent relief uh, got it. And, and that rent relief essentially would be the retailer paying 25% of the rent, uh, government paying 50% and landlord taking a 25% hit basically in terms of that. So I guess some landlords didn't want to take that hit, but uh, at the same time, they may not have tenants in their space for a very long time if uh, the business that was there went under. So I'm probably jumping a little bit here, but uh, um, what we've seen again with COVID is uh, a situation where uh, things are starting to progress. Uh, we're seeing retailers doing things that they would not have done if not for COVID-19 at this time. So um, because some stores had to close and because people were sheepish to go out and do things in a physical nature in terms of say going to uh, stores or restaurants, we saw an incredibly rapid growth in such things as click and collect, uh, curbside pickup, uh, contactless transactions. Uh, what we're seeing now is we're actually seeing retail moving into the future much faster than I think we would have uh, already, which, which I, I think is really, really fascinating. So in other words, because we're a consumer society and because we're seeing such an incredible uh, acceleration of technology right now, uh, we will be in some respects, say by October, five years into the future in terms of the technology usage of retail that we would have been if COVID had not happened. So uh, I definitely wouldn't want to say COVID-19 was in any way a good thing uh, in terms of something that, uh, you know, <laughs> would be desirable, but it, it certainly has moved us to, into the future from a technological perspective. Uh, which I think is quite remarkable. Uh, we're seeing an incredible growth in online shopping in Canada. It, uh, it almost doubled in two months in terms of uh, the number of Canadians that were shopping online. Um, now this is, I think, going to be habit forming uh, because once someone does something for a certain period of time, and if it's a positive experience, which would include such things as convenience and price, uh, consumers are likely to stay shopping online. Um, I was not a big online shopper myself until COVID-19 hit. And I found that I'm quite comfortable buying all kinds of stuff online uh, that I wouldn't have before. Granted, if you need something super fast, like I need some pillows, I'm going to run to HomeSense, which is about a 90 second walk from where I am right now after this. But, uh, you know, typically I would buy that online. I, I just, uh, I've got a house guest coming and I want to do some furnishing. <laughs> but, um, uh, you know, tech adoption in stores. Uh, what, what I think is really interesting, again, is... Uh, uh, now we've got these tech companies out there that are saying, well, what can we do to innovate? What can we do to make this more interesting and exciting and safer and, and you know, whatever else retailers and consumers are looking at? So uh, now we've got companies out there that are really looking to uh, solve problems. In the uh, photo I've got here, we've got a situation where this woman is virtually trying on an outfit. Um, we've got companies actually developing this technology for the home, so she may not even have to go into a physical store, but Nevertheless, she's there and uh, she's looking in a mirror and seeing what that uh, top or blouse, whatever you would call it, and that skirt would look like on her if she was actually wearing it. So 
uh, this is something I think will be more commonplace in retailers uh, to come in probably the next year or two uh, as, as retailers invest in these technologies. And again, some of these are a bit expensive, so you're not going to see your local mom and pop store, uh, you know, becoming like something you'd see in, say, South Korea in terms of technological uh, innovation uh, in the future. Um, one thing as well, certainly, is um, we are going to, at least in the short term, have quite a few vacancies on our streets as well as in our shopping centers and elsewhere. So uh, you'll be going, you know, down Rideau Street, there'll be some vacancies, uh, um, your local shopping center, some of the retailers that may have been at, say, Bayshore will not uh, be there or may have already closed, uh, even the big box centers, and in some case, outlet. Uh, um, we've seen, again, in, in physical retail space, the sanitization. Uh, other things that I certainly noticed have uh, been uh, foot traffic right now in shopping centers is down uh, in closed shopping centers anyways compared to, to what it was before this. Downtowns are struggling so the foot traffic at the CF Rideau Center is uh, a fraction of what it was say um, in January and February of this year. Uh, but outlet centers and uh, retailers which uh, are selling things at a bargain are actually doing really well. Uh, one thing that has surprised me is some uh, higher end brands are saying that sales right now are higher than they were at this time in 2019. And that is not something that I expected to see uh, in terms of, I thought, you know, the world was just going to shut down. People were going to, uh, uh, you know, be uh, uh, cocooning, but some people are getting out there wanting to have fun and uh, are, uh, you know, doing that. I, I had a video here and I'm not sure, uh, Kyle, if this is actually going to play, but. Okay, we could try it. Let's give it a shot. If not, then I'll just describe it, but it was, uh, oh, it's not going to work. It's just a weird thing with uh, PowerPoint. It's not working. But uh, basically what it was, was uh, there was a movie, I think it was the, funny enough, in the year 2000 called Minority Report and Tom Cruise is uh, going around, uh, you know, he's in the future and uh, he goes into a shopping center and then a store and the experience is just out of this world in terms of, uh, you know, this marketing messaging, you know, just flying in his face. There's, there's, you know, virtual reality, uh, artificial intelligence is able to uh, uh, determine who he is and where he is. I think some, one of the, one of the technologies got it wrong, but nevertheless, you know, it added some humor to, to the movie, but uh, that technology exists now. Uh, it's a matter of implementing it. So uh, we actually already, have moved into the future uh, in terms of uh, what technologies are available to make uh, retail spaces more interesting as well as uh, technologies uh, around uh, you know mobile phones which have uh, helped uh, propel social media and now we're seeing uh, online retail as well which is uh, uh, really 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 growing and uh, and Kyle we could talk about that a little bit in terms of uh, um, the growth in online retail uh, in Canada. Um, I'll leave this slide here and I can bring my face back on if you like and uh, discuss that a little bit because we've certainly had uh, retailers that have uh, been asking questions. Uh, I was working with the uh, Toronto uh, arm of Digital Main Street. I'm going to stop sharing here so that we can get my face back on here and uh, yeah feel free to email me. Check out the website. We're doing some fun stuff around uh, retail reporting. I, I just broke a story on Gucci opening at West Edmonton Mall. So, <laughs> but uh, yes, thank you for that. And uh, um, now, uh, you know, as we move into the future, uh, Digital Main Street is helping, uh, like you said, Kyle, uh, with a partnership with Shopify, Google, other partners to, uh, to get retailers online, which, which I think is going to be really, really critical because uh, again, some consumers are not comfortable going into retail spaces, but also some are just preferring to shop online. Um, I love to have a situation where rather than taking my chance and going to a store and not having product available, if I can go onto a website and see that, oh, this is there and I can buy it, uh, maybe I'll still go to the store and pick it up perhaps if it's near me and it's convenient. But uh, I, I still, you know, like to be able to have that. And, and I, I, you know, I've been burnt too many times being a fairly busy person. Uh, you know, going to my local store and not having something there. So I, I think that, you know, having an online experience is very critical. Uh, it's keeping up with what's happening. And, and retail now isn't necessarily competing with, uh, you know, other retailers. It's, it's competing with anything that's getting people's attention. And uh, that can be pretty much anything because in decades past, especially until the 1950s, uh, retail was in a lot of respects uh, entertainment. 
uh, especially again, the department store, which I, I, I keep dwelling on, but uh, it was such a critical uh, part of our, our retail experience at one time. If you think about, you know, the Thanksgiving day parades, uh, the Christmas windows that perhaps as a kid, we would have gone and seen. I sound really old saying that, but uh, certainly, uh, uh, you know, retail played a, a critical part of, of the past of our society. And now not nearly so much, unless it's, you know, the latest sneaker drop or the latest collaboration that say Off-White or Nike are doing in terms of a brand. I mean, the world has changed a whole lot in retail and, and it's important for retailers if they want to be successful moving forward to look at what is happening in the world um, from a consumer perspective and trying to address that. And, and that takes, you know, some real, uh, you know, ingenuity. I mean, it can, it can lead to, uh, you know, a, a very significant modification in business models for retailers. And, and that can be quite scary. So, uh, you know, the world is changing. We've got business models which have worked in the past, like, you know, MEC or Mountain Equipment Co-op, uh, you know, filed for, for creditor protection and was acquired at least tentatively by an American firm. Uh, you know, that retailer hadn't changed nearly as much as it should have. Uh, that's just one of many, many examples of retailers which, uh, you know, kept to doing things the way that they were doing them before. But because the consumer has changed so fast and so rapidly, they're going to uh, have to do that again. And now with COVID-19, as I said, with this acceleration in terms of uh, uh, technologi technology, uh, technology usage and social media, uh, again, we're going to see this really rapid progression in the way that the consumer behaves and what they're looking for. And if it's kind of scary, if, if businesses don't address that, uh, they could be doomed to fail. For sure. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Craig. Um, I have a couple questions here that I wrote down throughout your session, but um, let's encourage some people to uh, input some of your uh, questions into the Q&A function. Uh, and then I could re read them off to Craig, but I could maybe get started unless you have anything else you want to chat about, Craig. Oh, I'm happy to answer questions and more stuff will no doubt come up. And, uh, and I, don't yeah. want to, I know it's COVID and like we're still learning what this new, what this is, what, I don't even know what to call it right now. We keep calling it the new normal. Some people don't like that. So um, but yeah, it's really interesting. You said like when COVID hit, it was when retailers were trying to recover after the holiday season, early on in February and March, um, which brought something up. And I don't know if you have any insights on this, but how can some of our like smaller retailers and Main Street businesses, how can they prepare um, for Black Friday, Cyber Monday, the holiday season that's coming up? Because I know specifically, as you probably know, Toronto, Ottawa, and I believe it's the Peel region is having an influx of cases. And Doug Ford's talking about if we don't stop, we might go back into another lockdown. Um, so what would that look like in the holiday season? Because that's when retailers make the bulk of their money, right? That's right. Yeah. I mean, this is going to be an interesting holiday season, I think, in Canada because um, Black Friday, and this is more of an American thing. I mean, Black Friday certainly, you know, been a Canadian phenomenon, but you see the, uh, the videos in the United States of crowds, you know, a wave of people trying to get into a store fighting over a flat screen TV. Uh, you know, these are things that hopefully we won't see this year, uh, given that, you know, physical distancing is, is, is a mandate or at least strongly encouraged. But, um, it's, you know, it's, it's interesting because some retailers now are saying, well, you know, Black Friday was kind of a day or a week, just depending, you know, on, on the longevity that retailers had. Um, and I don't know if it's too late now, but, but, but some are actually looking at, you know, doing discounts for a longer period of time because, that longer time span is going to allow more people to be able to come in and get something. Now, granted, if you've got a, a door crasher, or we just use that term, uh, that's still going to cause crowds. But, um, you know, still discounting, I think, is going to be a thing. But, but I, I think that, you know, the, the discounting is going to be a challenge because everyone's, you know, either having a sale now or they're going to be having one. I know that that's not unique uh, at this time of year and moving into the fall, but uh, I think the discounts are going to be deeper. Uh, businesses are going to have to clear out their product. They're all going to be fighting to get in front of the consumer. And um, say for a smaller business that's on a main street, how do you get in front of your consumers and uh, get the word out? Uh, I mean, this is easier said than done. I mean, search engine optimization is going to be important. I'm definitely not an expert in this area, so maybe don't ask me questions. I, I have an overview of it, but I'm not an SEO expert. 
uh, but uh, but nevertheless, uh, in, in some cases, things like social media have shown success. Uh, there's a retailer called Brandy Melville that has, it still only has three stores in Canada, Toronto, Montreal, Vancouver, but through social media, primarily TikTok, uh, um, influencers have been talking about and wearing the clothing. And I would say probably every single day that that store has been open since June in Toronto, Montreal, and Vancouver, there have been long lineups and the lineups were so long in Vancouver that the Vancouver police department was actually talking to the BIA to look at crowd control options because, uh, which is I think a good problem to have for a retailer, especially at this time. And, and it's not even luxury goods. So, um, you know, certainly having that online presence is there, but, but getting consumers to that online site, as well as getting them into say a retail store uh, while remaining, you know, keeping a respectful, distance, you know, not having too many crowds uh, is going to be important as well. But, but this is going to be challenging. So if, if retailers were smart enough to have had uh, a client base in terms of, say, emails or contact information before this, this is an opportunity to be able to reach out to the clients and, and create something special, which I think is going to be important. And one of the reasons that in this, particularly in Toronto and Vancouver, why some luxury brands are seeing very high sales right now is because they're reaching out to their base of customers uh, whose contact information that they already had. And they're saying, well, we have this latest bag from Balenciaga or Miu Miu or Fendi and people are snapping them up and buying them. It's incredible. And so they're not necessarily going into the store. Some are, but uh, even though foot traffic is down, sales in some categories are up because they're selling direct to the consumer through online, whether or not it's WhatsApp or WeChat or just even text messaging. Great. Um, I see a few questions coming in here. Um, so Rebecca put in the chat uh, that she read an article today about a shortage of outdoor heaters as the weather gets cooler and high demand for outdoor living products like hiking shoes, activewear, etc. So do you see any categories within the retail sector that will thrive in the coming months? Yes, I mean, you just identified some of them here. <laughs> yeah, outdoor heaters. And that's not just going to be for individuals, uh, you know, businesses such as restaurants are going to be looking uh, at any way to be able to get, you know, customers to be able to linger on a patio as long as possible. Uh, some people may not be comfortable going into restaurant spaces or because of capacity limits, it's not going to be possible to get people in. I mean, I'm really worried as an aside about the food service business right now, because at capacities of 25 to 50%, I don't think a lot of them can be profitable because already the profit margins for most restaurants were not that high. And when you take away that many customers through a lack of capacity in this space, uh, you're taking away any opportunity for profit. So, so I, I am very, very worried. I mean, the food service industry is way more exposed right now than say, you know, the fashion apparel or jewelry or, or other good industries as well. But um, outdoor living products, absolutely. Uh, hiking shoes, active wear. I mean, I think that, you know, cross country skis and other uh, things will be quite uh, popular into the fall here. Um, you know, certainly some of your more typical categories, including, uh, uh, you know, outdoor fashions are, are going to be uh, popular. But again, you know, that's for, for outdoor living. We may see actually an increase in that as well. Um, I mean, Halloween, uh, we'll see. I don't know. I've heard some kids are still maybe going to be trick or treating. Uh, I'm not sure if all parents, well, a lot of parents are probably going to discourage that. So that's going to be interesting. But Halloween Alley, uh, this blows me away. I mean, they've leased uh, hundreds of spaces around the country and are selling costumes and other Halloween related things which uh, I, mean, I don't know what you call them products, I guess, but uh, uh, yeah, there are still certainly categories out there. I mean, obviously food and pharmacy are going to be big. We're probably going to, well, we are starting to see a second wave already for COVID-19. Um, Sylvain Charlebois from uh, Dalhousie University was saying, uh, chatting with him earlier, uh, he doesn't think there's going to be uh, the same panic. You know, toilet paper may not be missing from all the shelves like they were in March and April. That was a bit of a nightmare. <laughs> but, you know, those categories will still, I think, be high selling, but I think we have the supply chain in place as well as the product availability. And I don't think consumers are going to be panicking nearly as much. The first time, you know, we, we were like, almost like being born or, you know, like a fish out of water situation. We're like, oh my God, what do we do? I've never been in this situation. I'm not as worried about a second wave, but I think that at the same time, the consumer, which is going to be a bit 
spooked with a second wave uh, may hesitate to spend. And that would, you know, be from perhaps a bit of a conservative leaning because when things happen that are a bit scary, you know, many of us tend to pull back a little bit and just try to evaluate the situation. Some people may have lost their jobs. Other people might say, well, I don't know, even if I have money in the bank right now, if something happens in the future, I don't want to spend it all on stuff. I want to be able to make sure I have a nest egg or something to fall back on if God only knows what happens because 2020 has been such a weird year. So, um, you know, certainly, uh, uh, you know, there, there will be categories, I think, that will do quite well, uh, you know, moving into the winter months as well, uh, be it necessities or things for, you know, outdoor activities. Uh, I, I think that we will, you know, see spikes in those categories for sure. Awesome. And you mentioned uh, supply chains. So I know that was a big issue when, like, the borders closed and, and whatnot and trying to mitigate the spread of the virus earlier on this year. I know personally, I went to a bike shop two weeks ago trying to find a bike and some models aren't going to be ready until November, some until January, some until even next, next year in March. Wow. Um, needless to say, I didn't buy one. <laughs> um, but if we're having these kind of supply chain issues, uh, if we're looking at more winter related um, goods that might be in high demand. Do you see the supply chain like loosening up a little bit and flowing a little bit better or do you have any insight on that? It depends. I mean in terms of uh, say the actual delivery side of things it's a lot more under control than it was. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the biggest real estate growth sectors and opportunities is industrial in terms of storage. Uh, Amazon is building I mean I just use the A word. Amazon is building, you know, more and more warehouses. Um, they're looking at starting to do, you know, smaller fulfillment centers, uh, as well as certainly other retailers. Uh, uh, so from a delivery standpoint, we're starting to get things in order. I know that Canada Post had delays. Even Amazon had delays. Uh, uh, Walmart, uh, you know, we had grocery delivery. It got really, really challenging. But uh, from a product standpoint, yeah, I mean, I think that we've got an increased production of things like toilet paper, but obviously things like bicycles, uh, uh, this has been more of a challenge in terms of getting that product. So we may see some categories uh, that are still uh, going to have product shortages out there. But I, I think in terms of the necessities, you know, the, the kind of the food, clothing, shelter, if you want to call it that, um, I think we've got that more under control from, from a supply as well as from a uh, logistics standpoint. But uh, for, you know, certain things, I mean, I don't know, the, the next hottest video game, I mean, that will be also be, I think, a growth uh, sector. Uh, you know, there may be, a, may be a shortage there, but that's going to be specific to that particular product, I would say. Great. And then last question for me, and then we'll hop into a few more uh, audience questions. Um, so we were talking earlier a little bit about BIAs and like empty stores and whatnot and that being problematic. And I know we have a few um, represent rep representatives on the call right now from Ottawa's local BIAs uh, and spirit of it, I think it was yesterday you were telling me was the B anniversary of the first BIA. Um, yeah. So on that topic for BIAs, um, so how in these difficult times, do you have any, tr are you seeing any trends or any opportunities for our local BIAs to kind of use those free spaces? That's a good question. And I'm just pausing here because I have so many thoughts and most of them probably would never come to fruition because, because <laughs> you know, BIAs can do certain things. It's like, now I want to ask the attendees questions about BIAs because I'm super curious. Um, you know, I, I, I live in a neighborhood that is bounded by a BIA called Bloor Yorkville and I have all in Toronto, I, I have all of these ideas. So BIA's, uh, what's it, 17th today? So yesterday was the 50th anniversary of the founding of the first BIA in the world, which was Bloor West Village in Toronto. Uh, they've now since grown to become uh, a phenomenon throughout the world. So that's kind of a neat thing. It's a Canadian invention. Uh, in terms of opportunities, I mean, anything that can be done to garner a sense of community, I think is a good thing. Uh, one initiative that is happening in Toronto right now is uh, I think Royal Bank sponsored it. I'm not a plug for Royal Bank, but um, it's an art project. So and it, it's not small. What they're doing is they're getting people in the community to come together, locals, and, and basically, you know, redecorate parts of the neighborhood, do artwork, uh, you know, paint the streets, do something really interesting and, and make it a place that locals want to come to because this is an opportunity right now to really attract 
people that live near your BIA um, because some people are not as keen to travel. I know for myself, uh, um, you know, I, I don't drive a car in this city and I'm not keen on taking the subway. So, uh, you know, and sometimes maybe I'll take an Uber, but I am staying closer to home. So I do think this is an opportunity to engage with local consumers um, as a BIA, uh, as well as just, you know, switch things up and make things more exciting. Uh, uh, getting, you know, marketing messaging out there, I think is really important just as well as, you know, trying to hone in on that identity, you know, what is this neighborhood? Uh, you know, it, does it have, you know, an ethnic component to it? Uh, is it a high end neighborhood? Uh, does it have something else special about it? And, um, you know, at the same time, I, I wonder what can be done. I mean, I, I look at my own local BIA, I don't want to bash them in any way, but I see so many more opportunities that could be there. But, um, you know, I actually applied in 2013 or tw I think it's 2013 to be an executive director of, of a BIA in Vancouver. Um, on a very well-known street. I didn't get the job, which is probably a good thing because, uh, well, they didn't like me because I had all these grand ideas. I said, we're going to replace the sidewalks. We're going to do this. We're going to hold events. And they're like, no, 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 we're, we're, this is going to cost too much money and it's going to be disruptive. But um, one thing I think that BIAs need to do, uh, or at least neighborhoods, uh, however that's done is uh, obviously we've seen the rise in the shopping center and we've seen big box centers and outlet centers. And, and really over the years, our, downtowns and our neighborhoods have suffered as a result. Uh, we don't have the downtowns or the local retailer that we would have uh, had if, uh, you know, or certainly not what we had in the past. And if it wasn't for the fact that we saw this growth in shopping centers, uh, we would have extremely vibrant downtowns and neighborhoods. So uh, if you think about downtown Ottawa, I mean, if Bayshore and uh, other shopping centers uh, were not in the suburbs in Ottawa and people were still coming downtown. I mean, that would have been an incredible place where you still would have seen Simpsons and Freeman's, I guess by this time it would have been Hudson's Bay, but you'd still have all kinds of uh, retailers uh, that otherwise are not there. And uh, again, anything that you can do to compete, uh, say with the shopping center, uh, I, I think is, is going to be important. And one thing that I think that BIAs and neighborhoods have in their favor is authenticity and a sense of community because I've traveled around North America and beyond and, and shopping centers. I mean, there's obviously different kinds in terms of what you see, but very often they're quite similar. I mean, I can go to a shopping center in Indianapolis and I wouldn't know if I was in a place like Mississauga or Brampton, other than perhaps the mix of stores, because there's no Macy's in, you know, Canada. But, uh, but nevertheless, you know, the mall has become ubiquitous and, and, and in many cases, uh, a rather stare, you know, bland experience. And I think that that's something that, uh, you know, local street front communities can do to make things different is they, they have that organic growth and they, they have the opportunity, I think, to become a unique place that people could go. And, and right now, I think that as people especially have been stuck at home for a long time, I mean, obviously, uh, businesses are open again, but uh, creating something unique and different, I think, is really, really going to be beneficial and, and is going to help uh, street front retail compete against malls. I mean, this is probably the time for uh, BIAs and uh, street front retailers to come out and shine. Uh, also, what I think is interesting is in terms of leasing activity, because I do talk to a lot of brokers, uh, a lot of retailers right now are more interested in being on streets than in malls. And this was not generally the way it was before other than luxury in like Toronto and Vancouver. It wasn't really like that before for the most part. So uh, we are seeing a resurgence in the streets. Uh, one of the benefits to having a retail space on a street is being able to fulfill from the store 24 seven, because if you're in a mall, you've got mall hours, you can't fulfill orders. I mean, you could be doing deliveries in the middle of the night, maybe, maybe not, you know, for <laughs> sleep purposes, but you, you have that option with a street front retail space. So, so there's some benefits there, but um, in terms of the vacant spaces, I mean, I always thought that a BIA would, should have a temporary office. I mean, you could do pop-ups. I mean, look, look, you don't want your, your neighborhood becoming a pop-up center. This happened in New York City a few years ago when it became a little bit overkill because so many uh, retailers were leaving because the rents were astronomical because it was New York City. But uh, you know, I think certainly we'll see more innovation in spaces, temporary retail. Uh, we are seeing retailers actually seeing some bargains and actually signing leases right now to go into spaces. So. Uh, you know, and then even perhaps animating some of the windows. I mean, not all spaces are going to be filled. We're going to have, you know, 20, 30, 40% vacancies on some streets. And 
there's one company out of Regina, I forget the name of it, but they do uh, interactive uh, video screens on vacant retail spaces. I, I've seen some in Vancouver when I was visiting there and uh, things like that could be utilized as well. But uh, the last thing you want is to, is to have your neighborhood become uh, you know, vacated because uh, one thing I found, I've been studying consumer behavior, we do react to our environment. And if we're in a place that looks like it cares and that it's a place to be and that it's worthy of our time, we're more likely to stay. But if a place is dying, like I was doing consulting work for a neighborhood in Vancouver um, uh, called Little India, which uh, no longer really has an Indian population. They've all moved out, you know, demographics change. But, uh, you know, this, there were so many vacancies that the place didn't feel vibrant and didn't feel like a place that people wanted to be which really, really became a challenge. And, and so finding a way to animate storefronts, we've seen you know, murals, uh, again, I mentioned the artwork, anything that uh, uh, can be done to keep a place looking hopefully invigorated and not dead is going to be important to keep people wanting to come back there. Otherwise they're just going to go elsewhere or shop and eat at home. Uh, you know, that, that's, that's another option too. Fantastic, thank you so much, Craig. Um, so mentioning, like talking about malls now, flipping the coin here, um, where you're saying um, there's almost a preference for Main Street presence versus malls specifically due to COVID. Um, we have a question here, which lines up perfectly. So uh, what do you see in repositioning for retail malls? Is there an opportunity to build complete communi communities within these malls? I like this question because I did a study on this. <laughs> <laughs> Were you the one that put this in there? <laughs> no, no, no. It, it was someone named anonymous attendee, <laughs> which wasn't me. And, and um, no, this is really interesting. And when I mentioned acceleration in retail, I think this is going to happen here too. So Ottawa is a really uh, interesting market because you've got uh, landlords like Rio can that are actually redeveloping the retail centers. So I think that probably we had too much retail space in Canada. I mean, it was way worse in the United States or still is, but uh, you know, in Canada, we saw a lot of developers build a lot of retail space. And um, one of the benefits to being in Canada is uh, maybe it's not a benefit for, <laughs> because of the of the cost, but the cost of real estate. Um, we have cities which aren't all just sprawling out. I mean, I know that places like Ottawa have big suburbs, but there is still, you know, a desirability to, to live in the, you know, inner city, like places like the Glebe are really, you know, quite desirable. But um, what landowners are now seeing is an opportunity to densify and create complete communities within their shopping centers. So, I did a study for Retail Council of Canada and we looked at zoning applications and what uh, shopping center owners were looking at doing with their properties. And uh, what we found was uh, that they were looking to, I'll put it simply, they're looking to make money off of their property. So, uh, you know, you can make money by leasing retail space to retailers and that makes a certain number of dollars per year. But if you start doing things like putting housing, so if you put, you know, on the edge of a shopping center property, condominium buildings, which will create, uh, you know, money by the sale of those units or rental apartments will, which will create a continuous revenue stream for that landlord that owns that building. It also adds some customers to your property who live literally on site. Um, I think that COVID is going to speed this up. So already we were seeing quite a few shopping centers that were going to be redeveloped uh, small and large around the country. I think we're going to see more of that faster. Um, even Toronto's Yorkdale Shopping Centre, which was the most productive per square foot in Canada last year uh, when we did a study on that, uh, they're looking at creating a new city centre. Um, what I, so what I think is interesting is the, realist, the, the shopping centre developers to a degree are actually going to impact the future of our cities. Uh, they're you know, looking to add housing and other uses. They're going to be creating little town centres and and so, I mean, that's an incredible amount of power to have. And we will be seeing that more. I mean, the next couple of decades, I think are going to be really, really interesting in terms of uh, real estate development, because some of it will be taking place on shopping center properties. And, uh, and these landlords in partnership with other developers are going to be reshaping the face of our cities. So uh, I know absolutely, I mean, we'll be seeing this more and more. It's not gonna to happen tomorrow because it takes things like building applications and design and construction to actually build these things. but. Uh, no, absolutely. Um, I, I think that, say, in 20 years, you go, you'll be driving by your local shopping center property that might have been a low slung mall, and now it's going to have taller buildings and all kinds of uses, like offices, and maybe they'll have a park and a school. And this is actually, I think, interestingly enough, that was the vision of the inventor of the shopping center, Victor 
Gruen was the guy's name. Uh, he was from Austria. He moved to the United States. Uh, he developed uh, some shopping centers. I think the first one was Southdale uh, Shopping Center in Minneapolis or just outside of Minneapolis. I, I visited it a few times as a kid. Uh, and um, his, his vision was to have complete communities with, uh, you know, uh, residences, retail, restaurants, uh, even parks and schools. And uh, the developers of the shopping centers really just went with the retail side. They saw the business model as being something to make money off of. And he was pretty angry at that because he was actually more of an urbanist, I think, than people realize. I mean, he was designing pedestrian malls for downtowns and cities like Kalamazoo, uh, Michigan. But uh, nevertheless, now his vision for the shopping center, I think, is going to be fulfilled in decades to come because these are actually going to become mixed use properties. And part of the reason for that is because of the value of the land and the shortage of land that uh, is close to desirable areas such as workplaces. Awesome. Um, we have a very interesting question here. Uh, I'm not overly familiar with uh, what Corner Shop is. I just have you ever heard of Corner Shop? Yeah, yeah. Um, yes. I'm just having a look here. Uber's partnership with Corner Shop for local yeah. stores. I've seen big retailers like H&M, Sephora, and Rexall. Um, it could happen. I mean, and uh, you don't just have to use Uber. I mean, I noticed that Uber started to do uh, deliveries with, with all kinds of retailers. I mean, grocery. And it's funny enough, because I was just on my Uber app. I think it was on like Sunday night or something when I should have been sleeping. And I was like, I was like, my God, I, I can order groceries through this I can order and I have not done Uber Eats like where you order from a restaurant uh, I am not one of those innovators that's grabbing all the technology and doing stuff I study it but I don't necessarily do it but I will uh, I mean I'm already doing it because I'm old like I'm almost 44 I turn 44 next week but uh, uh, but nevertheless uh, you know yeah, these partnerships, and this is huge. I mean, there's companies out there. There's one called Shipper B. They're not in Ottawa yet, but they will be, I'm assuming, at some point. And it's almost like an Uber type of uh, delivery system. Uh, but one thing about the consumer now is they, because of things like Amazon Prime, we expect things to be fast. Uh, you know, we expect to get it at home and we expect it to get it quickly. And we don't want to pay for it or we don't want to pay much for it. So, uh, I mean, the competition, it's a little scary, actually. I mean, the competition is certainly there. Um, at some point, I think that local, local retailers are going to have to find a way again through companies like, like Shipper B, you know, an expansion of Corner Shop, uh, uh, you know, any, any other platform that's out there. And there are some that are coming through that we haven't even, you know, haven't been announced yet or that wouldn't be common knowledge uh, uh, to retailers. You know, the innovators are out there trying to solve this problem. So uh, I, th I think we'll see, you know, more and more of this uh, you know, in, in times to come in terms of, you know, getting something to people quickly. I mean, even groceries, I haven't tried Sobe's Voila yet, but uh, you can set it like a two hour window and they'll deliver your groceries. And apparently they're, they're, it's a pretty good service. We'll find out. I'll, I'll totally try it at some point, but I still like getting my groceries in person. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Um, there's a follow-up question here um, to, uh, to the, to the mall question that we were talking about earlier. Um, I feel like this isn't overly relevant. I can speak to it. I can yeah. speak to it. Yeah. So uh, what about new long-term care homes or senior centers right inside shopping centers to replace some retail space? I don't know about re replacing the retail space. I mean, if I was a senior and I feel like I'm getting there, um, <laughs> I'd love to, I'd love to live over a mall. I mean, um, one thing that we might see, and it really depends, uh, you know, if some shopping centers see enough retailers leave. So I'll use an example. It's not unfortunately an Ottawa example, but in Edmonton, Alberta, uh, there's a shopping center called the Bonnie Doon Shopping Center. It's a bit of a weird name, but it's a historical name. And uh, what they're doing there is, um, you know, traditional, rather boring, sorry, but I mean, they, they agree, shopping center. It had a Target and a Sears store as the anchors. Uh, basically what they're going to be doing over a couple of decades is basically imploding this mall and creating an entire neighborhood and a big part of this neighborhood is going to be housing for seniors, which I think is interesting. And again, it speaks to that whole uh, complete community scenario. Uh, the north end of the new Bonnie Dune, I was gonna say shopping center, but it may not be, will be uh, very much a health and wellness focused uh, place, uh, including I think a school uh, for health and wellness, which will be interesting. So uh, no, I, I, I think for sure. I mean, uh, for some of the malls that will have say, mass vacancies we may see say an entire wing of that mall uh demolished you wouldn't be able to put in probably supportive living in the shopping center uh as it was with the real estate just given you know how odd 
that would be for housing. You may not have exterior windows and whatnot, but the demolition of parts of the property could happen. And it's really, really case by case. I mean, what, I, what I'm hearing in terms of some businesses being interested in, in leasing and shopping centers, and it, you know, it could be for two years, but co-working spaces, like there are still different businesses out there that are looking at taking space in, in places such as shopping centers and utilizing it. But I, I think when you look longer term, uh, a lot of our uh, current shopping centers will be demolished. I, I wouldn't say so much for the CF Rideau Center, maybe not in our lifetime, but you never know. But a, a place like Bayshore may have tall buildings around it and eventually may become a street grid in the, in the future. Fantastic. Well, it looks like that's everything for questions. Um, so before we wrap up, do you have anything else you'd like to add today, Craig? Um, well, yeah, I mean, what message that I've given to, well, a lot of people generally is, uh, you know, stay strong, which I, I sounds like a bit of a silly thing to say, but I, I think that, you know, 2020 has been a really challenging year for a lot of people. And I'm saying this, you know, as a person as well, uh, you know, I've had some personal struggles. I've unfortunately lost a lot of people to death. Um, what we're seeing is, uh, uh, something is changing in our society right now. So from a business perspective, we're seeing a change in retail, but I think we're also seeing something a little bit bigger around, uh, uh, you know, equality and law enforcement. Um, but, you know, when, one thing I found that's really consistent is a lot of people are saying this is a really, really hard time and it's not even just about business. And I, I would say, you know, really this is a time for us to learn and to grow maybe to try new things, uh, try to change, but, but you know, reach out to people and, and talk to them, um, you know, and, and realize that at some point the world is going to be better. And, uh, you know, and to, I think and to, to kind of keep with that message and try to stay positive. I think that that's going to be incredibly important because, uh, and that's, that's the perspective that I'm taking right now too, uh, because we are, I mean, the reality is we're going to see a lot of businesses fail uh, you know, be it food service, fitness, retail, or otherwise. Uh, and this is part of life because like I said, when I went back in the history of retail, many of those businesses that I talked about do not exist anymore. The Hudson Bay company is one of the only ones that is still around after 350 years, I believe it's been. But um, one of the constants that we see in retail as well as in the world generally is change. And that change will continue to happen and we're going to see that change accelerate over the next one to two years. So um, this is, I think, going to be very much an education for a lot of people. Uh, it could be an exciting time to a degree, and we can get through this. And I think that would be my, my final message, which wouldn't even necessarily be related to this presentation, but I guess it is to a degree, is um, you know, you're not alone if you're struggling right now. Uh, this is a really crappy time for a lot of people, but we have gone through things in the past. We've gone through wars, we've gone through, uh, you know, plagues, and we've gone through all kinds of uh, challenging times, and we've gotten through it, and we can get over this as well, and, and, and hopefully the world is a much better place, uh, you know, if we ever meet again in five years. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Craig, uh, for your presentation, your words of encouragement, and answering all of the questions today. Uh, so we're nearing three o'clock, so uh, we will end it there. So uh, just a huge thank you again, Craig, for taking time out of your busy day to be here with us uh, and to give your uh, insights and, and whatnot. And I encourage everyone on the call to visit uh, Retail Insider's uh, website, and I can send a link uh, in my follow-up email that I'll be sending to all of you. So we could end things there. Hope you all have a good day. Hope you enjoyed the session, and we look forward to working with you in the future. Bye. Thank you, everyone.